As Christ prepared to leave his disciples following the resurrection, he promised to send the Comforter as a guide, likely a great comfort to Peter and other leaders, as they undertook the colossal challenge of taking the gospel to the world. Just as the Holy Ghost served as a conduit between Christ and Peter, so too can we find instruction, inspiration, and guidance from the Holy Spirit as we seek after Jesus through small and simple means. I invite you to join us in our study today and encourage each of us to request divine understanding that the Spirit may teach us individually and specifically. Welcome to Come Follow Up. The Holy Ghost works through me, especially in my role as mother and wife. The Holy Ghost works through me in various ways, through impressions, thoughts, or ideas that come into my head, feelings that come into my heart, ideas, it brings things to my remembrance. There's many, many times when I've needed His help with answers for my children, with things that I need to do for them, for understanding what they're going through, uh, and He's been really helpful that way. Oftentimes, He's taught me chastised me and comforted me in times of, of very hard times, and I've been very blessed, and He's taught me things to do and changes to be made, and I'm just very grateful for the Holy Ghost. Welcome, everybody. My name is Ben Lomu, and I am your host. Our Gospel Scholar for today is Patrick Mason. Patrick is an author and a professor of religious studies and history at Utah State University. He and his wife, Melissa, have four children and live in Logan, Utah. Patrick, welcome back. Thanks, Ben. Always good to be with you. <laughs> and our special guests today are Shane and Marianne Farnsworth. Shane holds a master's degree and a doctorate in education leadership and is the current superintendent of the Alpine School District. Marianne has devoted her time to raising their five sons and a daughter. Welcome, Shane and Marianne. Thank you. Thank you. And we're also joined by our studio audience. Thank you all for being here today. And to each of you at home, we are so happy to have you joining us for today's discussion. Please follow along and share your thoughts with us on any of our social media platforms. Today, we've selected two topics to discuss that relate to passages found in Acts chapters 1 through 5. These topics and discussions support and build upon the Come Follow Me resource developed and published by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The two topics we are going to discuss are first, Jesus Christ directs His Church through the Holy Ghost, and second, I can be perfected through small and simple means. After exploring these two topics with our panel and studio audience, We'll let our studio audience go and dive deeper into the scriptures with Patrick, Shane, and Marianne in footnotes. Okay, Patrick, so as we jump into our first topic, Jesus Christ directs His Church through the Holy Ghost, what sort of background and contextual information can you give us specifically to uh, this first topic as we jump into these first five chapters of Acts? Yeah, so I think first it's helpful to know a little bit what the book of Acts is. Okay. So it is that the full name is the Acts of the Apostles. And it is, if, if you like action-packed, like great stories, great characters, the book of Acts is for you. Okay. Be, because we get, so so Jesus is going to leave them uh, uh, behind. We, we, we get that right at the beginning of the book. And then the apostles are in charge of the church. They, they, they have to run the show now in, as after Jesus ascends into heaven. And so it focuses on, on their activities first of all in the church in Jerusalem, and then it, as it expands beyond that. And so it's just, I, I love the book of Acts. And it's, it's written by Luke, uh, so the same uh, person who wrote the gospel okay. of Luke. And it's, it's really kind of the second half of his, of his gospel. Okay. Now, I imagine that this has got to be pretty um, nerve-wracking for the yeah. apostles, uh, you know, as they you know, are stepping into this new role. Shane, Marianne, what do you think is going through their minds and how are they feeling now as they're taking over that Jesus is gone and it's up to them to continue his work? I would think there's some apprehension on their part, some nervousness. I remember in the 16th chapter of John, he's also, they're feeling this nervousness that he's going to go away. They said, what are we going to do without you? And now he's come back, but then he's going to leave again. And so I think there's some apprehension on mm -hmm. their part. They, are we up to the task? Yeah. Can we roll this forward? Can we move this work forward without him in, in our presence constantly? You know, Shane, you also, uh, you serve as a stake president. 
Do you ever see any of this similar apprehension as you see missionaries going out into the mission field? Yeah, I see that in interviews as they come in. I ask them, are there any apprehensions or feelings you have? And they say, I just don't know what to expect. I'm nervous <laughs> about things. And I think it's so telling that the scripted thing that you do in the setting apart is to set them apart as a missionary of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and give them the authority to act in the name of Jesus Christ. And I explained to them that there's great power in that, that the Holy Ghost will enable you to act in the name of Jesus Christ, just like the apostles mm -hmm. were enabled to act in the name of Jesus Christ through the influence of the Holy Ghost. And well, what you're doing is exactly what Christ did uh, with them. If you look at verse 8 of, of chapter 1, he says, "Ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses of me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the, and the whole earth. Uh, and so that's what he says, is, is the, the bestowal of the Holy Ghost will give you the power that you need to, to go out and be witnesses to the whole world. So Marianne, from your experience, how do you try to help your six children uh, gain that reliance, that dependence on the Holy Ghost and what it can do for them as they go out and about and live their lives? I think it's those small and simple promptings that they receive to try, we're at, told them we're to receive the Holy Ghost, that we'll always have that presence to be with us if we're living, keeping the commandments. So I just encourage them to live the gospel and then feel that they can trust the promptings that come to them, that those should be through the Holy Ghost and that they can uh, move forward with some confidence. And I think sometimes we overthink things. I like that. Patrick, uh, so for the apostles, this is, this is new. Yeah. They're about to go out and they have to understand what it's like to, to go out and teach and preach and, and perform miracles uh, without the Savior. Can we jump in and find out what is he going to do for them so that they don't feel comfortless and alone? Yeah. What he's going to do is he's, he's going to do exactly what he promised, which is to send the Holy Ghost. And he had promised this even when he was with them. If you, if you go back to John chapter 14, mm -hmm. the last night that he was with them, he promised that he would send another, another comforter, comforter, right? That he would not leave them comfortless, uh, which is just beautiful. In chapter two, verse one, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, and uh, Pentecost is a Jewish festival that's 50 days after Passover. So when the, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. So this was the promise that he had given them, that I will send the Holy Ghost. And at this point, this is where their ministry really takes off because they, they're empowered now by the Spirit. Okay. I would love to hear some thoughts from the audience on how have you learned to feel and rely on the promptings of the Holy Ghost? Kelly. I actually had an experience happen to me. Um, it's been quite a few years ago, but... Um, it was during the holiday time, and I was going to wash my card, and the prompting told me to go home. And I'm like, no, I'm going to wash the car. And it said, no, go home. And I put it off again, and finally it you know, came to me again, and this time it was, no, go home. And I'm like, okay, I'm going home. As I'm driving down my street, there was a little girl on my road, and she was only like about two, two and a half years old. It was winter time and no adults around at all. And so I said to her, you know, and to a two-year-old who could hardly talk, you know, what's your name? And she just kind of shrugged. So I took my coat off and put it around her and called the police. Come to find out, she was visiting her grandmother and the grandma had fallen asleep and she had snuck out the front door. I'm so grateful that I listened to that prompting because I thought, what if, what if something had happened to her? I've learned that no matter how small it is, that I always try to act upon it. Thank you so much for sharing that. And this is something, Patrick, that the apostles are gonna have to do because they have a really big task ahead of them, not only for themselves to feel Christ's presence, but he's trying to build and create something through them. Can we talk a little bit about that? This, uh, the, the creation, the formation of his church yeah. through the Holy Ghost? Yeah, I love this. I mean, this is what we see in these first few chapters of Acts is the beginning of, of this church uh, in, in the absence now of, of, of Jesus. And I love the description of it. This is one of my favorite 
uh, passages here in, at the end of chapter two that it describes what this church looks like, this community that they're starting to build under the direction of the apostles and, and the Holy Spirit. Let's uh, start in, in verse 42, that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And then look at the community that is created. Verse 44, and all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. They were so transformed by the Holy Spirit and, and by the care that they should have for one another, that they had all things in common. Very similar kinds of verses that we see in 4th Nephi mm -hmm. in the church in the Book of Mormon after Jesus' uh, ministry there. Very similar kinds of things in the early restored church in the 1800s, where these people are so transformed by Jesus Christ that, that it even transforms the way that they care for one another so that there'd be no poor among them. Yeah. So back then, when, when Christ promised to send them a comforter, the apostles were really relying on the Holy Ghost to lead and guide the church. Today, how do we learn to exercise faith in the leadership of the apostles and prophets as they are being led and guided by the Spirit? The example here, Patrick, that you read, I think they had been baptized, mm -hmm. they had entered into covenants, and the Holy Ghost really helped them keep those covenants. Mm -hmm. It... it uh, amplified their ability, probably sunk that witness deep into their heart, so it became part of their belief system yeah. and their behavior system. They just said, we want to keep our covenants. We want to be followers of Jesus Christ. So I think the same is true for us. As we become more covenant-minded, we align ourselves with the word and will of the Lord through his servants, the apostles and prophets, we have that alignment with the Lord, and as we are aligned with the Lord, we have that promise through our covenants to have His Spirit to be mm -hmm. with us. I think that's the process of covenant making and keeping as we are aligned with the Lord to have the Spirit uh, to be with us, to uh, settle that in our hearts, to encourage us to, uh, to live in accordance with what the prophets teach us. So my brain went a totally different way. Okay. Not quite with what you asked, but there's this power when we come together as a covenant body of Christ and really spend time together that the Holy Ghost witnesses to the group mm -hmm. as well, not just the individual, but there's a power in that group, grouping together that comes upon us. You know, I love how as we talk about the these early apostles being led by the Holy Ghost to guide the church at large, we can do the same thing as we've been encouraged to make our homes, you know, more Christ-centered, that we use that same spirit to lead and guide uh, our families. And I look forward to continuing this discussion and maybe diving a little deeper as we uh, get to footnotes later on. But I just wanna thank all of you for sharing your thoughts and insights on our first topic of Christ directing his church through the Holy Ghost. And for the audience, uh, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us as well. And for you at home, how have you come to know that Jesus Christ still directs his church today? Share with us on Facebook and Instagram. I think it's important for us to change and progress in life because life is change. It's important every day to just continually grow and learn and you know just try to, to be better. Without change, there can be no growth. Uh, much like a butterfly, for example. Uh, they start off as caterpillars, um, nothing too remarkable there, but they go through this massive change and they become a butterfly. Uh, something that is commonly known to be like one of the most beautiful things that there are. And I think us as humans are like that. We need to go through changes in life to find our inner excellence. I love the talk by Sister Nielsen about always asking yourself that question, what would a holy person do? It's just such a great way to just remind yourself of, um, you know, how to you know how to respond to situations you know how to just make yourself better and it's just so important that we're continually changing and learning and growing and you know, that's the way right that's that's the way you know we can get closer to heavenly father closer to perfection
The second topic we're going to discuss today is I can be perfected through small and simple means. Okay, let's jump right back into this, Patrick, mm -hmm. and uh, talking about the the saints and this new task that they're taking on of, of building the church, of learning post Christ's mortal ministry. What can we learn about this idea of those small and simple things as they are continuing forward? Yeah, yeah. On, on one level, it sort of seems like uh, this this topic seems a little bit strange, given that the Book of Acts is full of anything but small and simple things. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's miracles all over the place, and I think sometimes when we read the scriptures and we see these big miracles, right, the Red Sea or these healings or whatever, sometimes we say like, "That's not happening in my life," <laughs> right? Uh, what am and I doing wrong? Right? What am I doing wrong? Yeah. Right? Exactly. Um, and so, so I think it's really important to zero in on on the ways that, in fact, the church was built on small and simple okay. means the way that that actually functions a little bit more like in our lives uh, than maybe the big, huge things. And, and I think we see this beginning in chapter two, all these people who are gathered when they hear Peter and the apostles preaching. Now, all of a sudden in verse 37, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And then this very famous response, Peter says unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But that notion of being pricked in their heart, right? That's, that's a really small thing, you know, yeah, a pinprick, like a pinprick right? right? Yeah, exactly. So this is the kind of small and simple thing that, that the church is built upon is the Holy Ghost pricking us in our hearts. And all of us can feel that. Shane and Marianne, what thoughts do you have as we talk about just how important it is to pay attention to those small, simple things as we try to create something wonderful. It made me think about the example in the Book of Mormon of Lamoni's father. Let me turn to that really fast. Where uh, King Lamoni uh, was traveling with Ammon, and they meet his father, and there's you know the contention, I guess, right. or the <laughs> argument. But then the father leaves and he says in chapter 22 of Alma, verse three, in the middle, he said, I have been somewhat troubled in mind because of the generosity and greatness of the words of thy brother Ammon. So because of that experience, it just plays in his mind and it softens his heart to the point that he's willing to listen to Aaron. And then big things happen from wow. that small seed that was planted from that experience. Any thoughts you have, Shane, on this as well? The end of 39, this chapter 2, verse 39, for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. I think that's telling that the Lord calls us to come unto his Son through the medium of the Holy Ghost. And that promise is unto, it wasn't unique to those individuals, it's unto all who will listen to the calling of the Lord. I think of Alma 32, it says, even if you just have a desire yeah. to believe, and then he builds that you can build on that desire to strengthen your faith, and then it will start to grow, and then you can act. So that prick, that needs to be followed by faith in Jesus Christ. And then from that faith in Jesus Christ, it continues to build. I don't think the prick necessarily is faith. The prick is something's there. Now can I exercise faith in that? So what are some of the things that you have been able to do or accomplish throughout your lives that started by that small little whispering or nudge from the Holy Ghost? I think when we were, we were first married, first planning on getting married, we had lots of conversations, and I think there was some pricking in the hearts about how do you want to structure your family? Okay. What are some commitments you want to make to each other in the gospel of Jesus Christ that we're starting this family? There was some pricking in our hearts about, I think, some revelations, some ideas that came in, some vision of things that were beyond what we could imagine that we made commitments to, to one another, to say we're going to have a gospel-centered home. That's just going to be part of who we are. And then as we built upon that through actions over the year, we saw the fruits of that. But it started with a prick to say, mm -hmm. we want to get married. We want to build a family together. We want to have a gospel-centered home. What is that going to entail? And it required a lot of effort over the years, but it began with that prick of we're coming together as a husband and wife, starting a family, and what do we want to achieve and accomplish? So that's something that comes to mind. I would love to hear from the audience. I'll ask you the same question. How have you been led through those small whisperings of the Holy Ghost to, to bigger things in your life? Renee. 
I grew up in Utah with great friends, but I was not a member. My family's not, uh, we're not members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And my friends just loved to talk to me about the church. And my parents wouldn't let me go to primary, wouldn't let me go to young women's. And then when I got into college, I met some other great wonderful friends. So I'd go to the activities and just have fun. And I was kind of playing with the church. I loved being the center of attention. (laughs) Then one day they took me to a fireside and it was the mission home downtown. You can tell how old I am. Sister Richards was the mission mom. And she, at the end of the tour of the mission home, handed out some cake on a platter, and each one had a scroll on it. And as I opened my scroll, it was John chapter 8, verse 32, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And and I couldn't breathe. It was like, don't play with this. This, you've got to be serious about this. And that started the mission discussions, which became a baptism, which was so difficult for my parents. And and then I had to leave my home. And um, but then I met my husband in a temple marriage, and 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 <laughs> just a life of love and knowledge and belief. And and my mother still dislikes the church, but we are so close. You know, it's it's a beautiful story, and it really fits in with what happens so often when when you follow those promptings. Just like with the saints back then, it's not like your life is perfect, and that you are all of a sudden all your problems go away. These saints, they still had to deal with some of the opposition that Renee was talking about that she dealt with. Yeah, absolutely. And Jesus had had prophesied this. He says, you know, blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. He said that to follow him means to take up his cross. Part of discipleship is a willingness to suffer for the sake of the name of Christ. And and we read about that in the book of Acts on how the saints felt about some of this suffering uh, that they were experiencing. Can we can we go to those? I think is it chapter five or yeah, the end of of, of, of chapter five. And uh, Shane, you you were talking about this earlier. Chapter five, verse forty one. Do you want to read that? Yes. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. We had a question coming from one of our viewers about this, and. Let's watch the question, and then I want to come back and and dive a little deeper into a discussion about what they're asking. Hi, my name is Josh Davis. I'm from California. And uh, my question is, at the end of chapter 5, it talks about how um, the apostles suffered shame for Christ's name, but that they rejoiced, that they were worthy to do so. And um, my question is, I was just wondering how we can rejoice even when we feel ashamed or when we're going through hard times. It's a really good question. Uh, let's start with you two. Uh, how, how do you feel about this answering this question about rejoicing amidst persecution? I think that's really telling even in our day. There's There can be a shame culture in our day when we stand for truth and righteousness, stand up for those principles, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I think that rejoicing comes because of the Holy Ghost, because of that renewal, because of that sense of peace that comes into us. Even if the world around us is mocking and making fun of, putting in prison, we can rejoice that we were counted worthy, have the opportunity to bear testimony of Jesus Christ. So I think that rejoicing comes as a fruit of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. I think there's confidence that comes when we uh, walk uprightly before God, when we testify of Jesus Christ, that's the mission and role of the Holy Ghost. And so when we do that work, we engage in testifying of Christ, the Holy Ghost will strengthen us and cause rejoicing in us, even if those around us aren't rejoicing about our testimony. Mm -hmm. So I think it's an internal thing that uh, comes from the Holy Ghost strengthening us as we testify of Christ. I would say I feel probably most 
poorly or bad when I feel internal dissonance that I'm not doing what I know I should or I've displeased Heavenly Father or I've let him down. Okay. So I think acting in a way that I feel like I've witnessed for him like I should have, that piece like Shane was talking about, I think that's a better piece than what I would get from praise from the world because I know that I'm honoring my covenants and I'm at peace with God. Um, so what are some of those small, simple things that, that you've seen work um, to, to be able to find the joy no matter what is happening in our lives? What are some of those small, simple things that we can focus on or that you focus on that have brought you that joy and happiness from living the gospel? Well, they're the great answers of prayer. Scripture study, for me, being in the temple is a great place of peace and working towards having peaceful relationships with those who are most important in my life brings me a lot of peace. You know, that's exactly what they were doing in these chapters, mm -hmm. right? They were praying, they were reading the scriptures, they were at the temple and 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 they were serving others. I mean, it's the, the formula hasn't changed yeah. in 2000 years. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Patrick, I think another key point is there it mentions them partaking of the sacrament. Yep. That that renewal of covenants in that we promise to obey his commandments and always remember him. What helps me always remember him is to change that to always be mindful of the Savior. And the more mindful or the more my mind is full of thoughts about the Savior, the more likely I am to have his spirit to be with me. And that spirit is what causes that wholeness or that perfecting or that processing, but it takes being mindful mm -hmm. of Jesus Christ, of renewing that covenant and being uh, consistently keeping that covenant as we go throughout the week. And that comes, as Marianne mentioned, through prayer, uh, through scripture study, through being intentional about our peaceful relationships uh, with others, that peaceable walk with the children of Christ. Yeah, multiple times here it talks about their daily practice, right? They were at the temple daily or, or, or they were praying daily, they were gathering. And so this is regular, you know, religious observance is, is what brought power into their life. Thank you so much for, for contributing in our second discussion topic. And for our audience, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and insights on the importance of those small and simple things. And for those at home, we still have so much to cover from these chapters in the book of Acts. Stay with us. I think what really stood out to me in our discussions today was that the pattern continues, that Christ is the center of the church, the center of our development and becoming more like him. And the Holy Ghost is the medium through which that progression and development, repentance, um, testimony comes. I liked how they were talking about the acts of the apostles as like almost like them feeling apprehensive about Jesus leaving right at the beginning and uh, not really knowing what, how they're going to work with it. And then the Holy Ghost coming and calming them and being able to help them teach what they needed to teach to the people. One of the things that stood out to me was it was a privilege to suffer for God. And I thought about that and thought about how they were not timid, but they were following Jesus the whole time he was he was here. And now they were they were true disciples of Christ and and fighting for him and his gospel and thousands joined the, the church because they had the Holy Ghost. And then it was a privilege to suffer for him. Welcome to Come Follow Up Footnotes. We've dismissed our studio audience and are looking forward to building upon our previous discussions about Acts chapters 1 through 5 with Patrick, Shane, and Marianne. I've loved our discussions. Um, is there anything that we want to revisit? We've talked about a lot of really good things about you know, the importance of a small, uh, simple things. 
uh, the comforter that we've been promised to send? Where would you like to go or revisit? Well, I think uh, w one of the great uh, moments, the defining moments of, of these chapters and of, of the, the beginnings of Christianity come at the beginning of, of Acts chapter 2. Day of Pentecost, uh, this is 50 days after, after Passover, 50 days after Jesus' crucifixion and, and resurrection. This rushing, this, the sound of a rushing mighty wind, the, the tongues of fire. And then verse 4 of chapter 2. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now, I mean, it's like their world, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there wasn't anybody from China or, or okay. you know, South America, but, you know, still in, in their broad world. And then verse six, now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, behold, are these not all these which speak Galileans? They knew, like, these guys don't speak all our languages. These are just regular Galileans. How do we hear every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? And then the next few verses list a whole, do, a whole bunch of different nationalities. And, and it basically goes from east to west here. But, but the, the point here is these were from all over the place. And they all spoke different languages. And they heard the apostles speaking in their own, it's, in their it's like they had like, you know, those headsets on, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. That they were hearing, but, but they didn't. And, and, wow. and so it was, everybody knew it was miraculous. In verse 12, they were all amazed, but were also in doubt saying like, what, what does this mean? And some said that they're full of new wine, like they're drunk. drunk. Uh, I like a few <laughs> verses later, they say it's only nine o'clock in the morning. Like, <laughs> like, like, they, they, they can't be drunk. But clearly then, and then Peter gets up and, and talks about how the spirit will come upon them. But this is a really important moment in, um, in, in the early church. And the way that I like to think about this is that this is God sort of reversing the curse of the Tower of Babel. Okay. Remember, so the Tower of Babel is the people come together, they want to get to God on their own, mm -hmm. right? And, and so God divides and separates the languages. Here, what God is doing is, now these are people who are trying to be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. What does God do? He heals the division of all those languages, right? This is him through the Holy Spirit sort of reversing that curse mm -hmm. that, that, that came upon the, the earth earth. And um, so I think it's so beautiful the way that we see this. And this is going to prepare them. Uh, it's, it's kind of a hint or a kind of signal. Like when I say go out into all the world, I mean it. And he's going to prepare them through the spirit to, to do this. I, th I think it's just beautiful. I think after this Pentecostal experience that the apostles felt like, wow, the Holy Ghost really is real and I can move forward. And they had this boldness and confidence you see as they continue to testify of Jesus Christ. And I think that as we give our youth these opportunities to learn and lead, that they grow in their confidence mm -hmm. that the Holy Ghost can help them, that Heavenly Father's there, that their trust in the Lord increases, and they're gonna be able to move forward with boldness and confidence in the things that Heavenly Father will ask them to do. Yeah, and, and, and that's exactly what it says here in, in Acts chapter four, verse 31. It talks about how they had prayed and, and they had assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. And I love verse 33. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and great grace was upon them all. I just love that idea of this grace settling on them as they move forward. And I'll go backwards of okay, verse, okay. right? <laughs> uh, exactly. The, the, and that grace, their testimony of Jesus Christ, then allowed the multitude of them that believed to become of one heart and one soul. We see the same kind of language in 4th Nephi and other places in, in the Doctrine and Covenants to be one. That's, that's what the Holy Ghost it takes from all of this diversity, mm -hmm. and, and it makes us of one heart and one soul. Yeah. And it's such, to me, when I read this and reread it, it's such a contrast to the a little bit of wavering of the apostles' testimonies before, before that, yeah, before the Holy Ghost. And as we read this and talked about it, it just over and over again, they were so bold and so sure in their testimony. And this idea of, that Marianne read, this power and grace came upon them. The power comes upon us and grace comes upon us, that enabling power of the of the atonement of Jesus Christ comes through the medium of the Holy Ghost. And I think we see that in the apostles are a great example of how the Holy Ghost magnified their capacity 
gave them boldness, gave them power, gave them grace to become really strong witnesses of Jesus Christ. And that same opportunity is available to us. We have that same access to that power and that grace to be bold in our testimony of Jesus Christ. And, and I think, you know, we, we talk about that in the modern church, I think especially in the context of missionaries, right? These 18, 19, 20-year-old uh, young people who, who go out, and just graduated from high school or something like that. And, and, and then it is, it's the Holy Ghost that get, lets them do that. But like you say, this, this applies to everybody. This isn't just missionaries. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've, I've seen, uh, you know, primary teachers and Sunday school teachers who were maybe kind of scared to get that calling, but who took it seriously, yeah. who prayed and prepared and sought the Spirit, and they went into those classrooms and did exactly what God needed them to do in that classroom. So it, it, it applies up and down the, the, the church in every sphere. In, in verse 32 of chapter 5, Peter's talking with the other apostles. He says, We are his witnesses of these things, as also is the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. So here they're saying it's available. This power is available to all who are willing to keep the commandments. Yeah. And I love how, if you know, when, when Peter and John are arrested mm -hmm. and Peter's testimony, uh, speaking about boldness, he gives this powerful testimony about Jesus Christ in verse 12. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. This preaching of, of salvation through, through Jesus Christ. And, and then if you go down in verse 13, the next verse, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, you know, they're standing before this council. They see how bold they are. They recognize like these are a couple, these are fishermen. These are normal guys. They're unlearned, unlearned they're ignorant, yeah. but they marvel through their testimony of Jesus Christ. And that comes through the Holy Ghost as we boldly testify. And, and this is where change happens. This is how we, we literally change the world through testifying of Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost. Well, as he did on the day of Pentecost, we poured across all those within the sound of our voice. You know, I was thinking as we talked about the Savior promising to not leave them comfortless. Uh, when they had this new, overwhelming, challenging assignment to take the gospel to all the world, mm -hmm. to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. And I think sometimes in our callings, we feel the same way. We get a new calling or an assignment, and we make sense of it, and then we have to go out and do it, and we can feel a little bit comfortless, like it's, it's challenging. I remember when I was called a stake president, it's about four years ago, Elder Curtis and the Area 3070 was with him, they called me, we had the meetings, I was with them. I, I didn't feel any apprehension at all. And then they did a little bit of training for like a half hour, 45 minutes, and uh, they left. And I was just kind of sitting there and I was, felt a little comfortless. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember relying upon Marianne a lot, just saying, you know, I don't know that I'm up to this. Mm -hmm. I, this is a challenging assignment responsibility, but through the Holy Ghost, I gained confidence to be able to do the work that I've been called to do, that I felt comforted in relying upon the Holy Ghost. I remember we had to replace two bishops. My, I was serving as a bishop when I was called, and my first counselor was serving as a bishop, and I called him, so we had to come up with two bishops. And uh, we had to go through that process of receiving rev revelation to do so, and it was a wonderful process, mm -hmm. and we weren't left comfortless. The Holy Ghost came and gave direction and guidance as to who the Lord would have us call. And I think as we get into the practice of doing our calling and rely upon the Holy Ghost, we find comfort mm -hmm. in that. And I think that's true for other people that accept assignments, responsibilities, that they can learn to rely upon the Holy Ghost, that the Lord will not leave them comfortless, that right. He will qualify whom He calls, and that qualification comes through the medium mm -hmm. of the Holy Ghost. I remember and I'm sure you all can relate to this. I remember when we had our first child and, you know, you, you go through the whole experience and sometimes it can be chaotic and it's wonderful, all these mixed emotions. And then all of a sudden, you know, your stay at the hospital is over and they get the car seat. It's like, all right, there you go. There you go. <laughs> and the doors close behind you. And it's like, wait, aren't you going to come to my house and, <laughs> and you know, that. walk me through this? You know, there's, we have those experiences and like you said, that the reliance uh, on the Holy Ghost is is very real in those moments. Uh, any other experiences of, of of really depending and and feeling that you you really weren't ever left alone? Uh, that the Holy Ghost has been with you in those difficult times in our lives. 
Well, you bring up parenting, I would say probably in mothering. Mm -hmm. um, there's a steep learning curve, but I do feel like Heavenly Father, one of the gifts that He gives us is this power to nurture and this ability to nurture. But as you turn to Him, He strengthens you and helps you have an understanding of this little person and, and know what you can do mm -hmm. to help keep them alive, do you know what I mean? <laughs> but not only alive, but to prosper and grow. And But I think we we grow into that. I was so much more confident with my second, obviously, right. and the next one. So I think it's learning to trust in the Lord, but also giving ourselves some grace and patience mm -hmm. while we go through that learning process. Yeah, something that I'm still learning is probably a lifetime learning thing uh, to, to really rely on on the Spirit, and but combine it with your own preparation, all right? Mm -hmm. It's it's not one or the other. It's it's a combination of the two. And we've all been asked to do this as, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We recently have been focusing so much on a home-centered church where you have to rely so much on the Holy Ghost to cater it to your own individual family and the needs of our family, because it looks different for, for everybody. Patrick, can we talk a little bit more about this idea of what was church really like for, for the early saints and how that relates to us and our reliance on the Spirit as we try to bring that into our home? Yeah, so, so uh, w within the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we've, we've talked about how home-centered church is like this new thing. Right. It's not a new thing at all. It's about a 2,000-year-old thing, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> actually. Uh, the, the, that is the way that the earliest Christians worshiped. They gathered in houses. And if, if you go to chapter 2 of Acts, in 46, it says, and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple. So they, they lived in Jerusalem. They would go, to the, the apostles and others would go to the temple to pray and to worship. But then look at the next line and breaking bread from house to house. And we know this from archaeology, from written records and so forth. The earliest Christians met in houses. They didn't have buildings. Uh, in fact, they didn't build buildings for a long time, for centuries. Mm -hmm. But the whole religion started in people's homes, both in their own families and then welcoming other people into their homes. So when we do that today, mm -hmm. when we're nurturing testimony in the home, uh, when, when we're building our religion, building faith in the home, we're doing exactly what the very earliest Christians did. And from, you know, from what you all have seen in, with your own experience and, and Shane as, as a stake president, how have you seen the effects of this home-centered uh, uh, church, um, how has that changed families? How has it changed your own family? I think those, it's the opportunity, right? The agency to really engage in it at home. And I think as stake leaders, we see, uh, and we've even heard from uh, ward teachers that say, we can tell those families who are engaged mm -hmm. in Come Follow Me at Home. They just bring a different spirit, a different understanding into the discussion uh, when we do meet at church. And so I think in, in our family, it's taking that responsibility to make sure that we are engaging in those religious practices, that taking responsibility for the spiritual growth of ourselves and our children, uh, creating conditions where they can thrive spiritually, not being dependent upon a Sunday-only instruction for our gospel nurturing. And how do you, and I, I'm, I'm sure that in your stake, you have all kinds of different homes and households, right? There's some with maybe with a traditional nuclear family where mom, dad, and kids are all members of the church. I'm sure there's some where it's just one spouse is a member or maybe only one kid or, or a widow or, or you know, something. So, so what does that look like on the ground in terms of how a home-centered church can actually meet lots of different needs of different kinds of homes? Well, I'll just say, we. Yeah. I feel like our family is in flux right now. As we talked about, we used to have six children at mm -hmm. home, and we could have one of those cute little family home uh, evening charts yeah. where everybody had a responsibility. <laughs> and now we've got one child at home, and so we don't use the chart. Do you know they, what I mean? They get all six jobs. Yeah. Right. <laughs> or it feels like the chance to pray rolls around several <laughs> times a day. So yeah, I think uh, we have to be open to changing and improvising and finding new ways to make it work. There's a group of sisters in my ward that meet together once a week to go over Come Follow Me. So they study at home, but since they don't have somebody in their home that they mm -hmm. can talk to, they make small groups. So I think making those small groups within our homes and inviting other members to join with us is a way to supplement when we don't have 
family members living within our walls. Yeah, I think sometimes we forget that even when, when the church introduced this concept that the leaders talked about, you know, customize this to, to what your mm -hmm. circumstances look like. And if that means bringing other people in and, and studying together, then, then go for it. Yeah. Yeah. We have, uh, we've encouraged our bishops, our young women's leaders to invite the youth into their homes from time to time because we don't know what their home situation is like. Um, those that are come from a single parent family or the gospel is not lived fully in their home, to give them an opportunity and experience to see what a Christ-centered home is all about. I remember talking with the Utah Orem Mission President. He said it's such a blessing to bring in missionaries from all over the world who come from different levels of engagement in the gospel of Jesus Christ in their home to come in, and we want the missionaries in the homes of the saints so they can see what a gospel-centered home looks like, so they can start to pattern it. So we do the same thing in our stake. We encourage our youth leaders or bishops, bishopring members to say, get the youth, particularly those that uh, come from a family that is not fully embracing the gospel of Jesus Christ, that opportunity to feel and see what a home-centered or a Christ-centered home feels and looks like. Yeah, I have, I have a good friend who who uh, studies the scriptures and uses the Come Follow Me curriculum. Uh, he's a member of the church and he does it with a, a good friend who's not a member of the church and, and they're studying the Bible together doing this. And so so that, that you know, this kind of study, this, this, this kind of building our homes and our lives around Christ can just take lots of different forms. Yeah, yeah I think this home-centered church shouldn't mean that we can only do it with our family right. in our home. Mm -hmm. Because as we've read over and over again, it's having things in common. It's getting together with the other saints. So yes, and home-centered, but it may be in larger circles just Literally. a little bit. Yeah. 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 When, when, when I was a, a, a graduate student at, at Notre Dame, I was a long ways from family. Uh, that's where I might, met my wife. She was a long ways from family. And we had a family there, actually two families who got together for Sunday dinner because they didn't have a lot of relatives or other things. And, and so we had dinner together almost every Sunday. And that they became my family, right? So family can take on lots of different forms depending mm -hmm. on circumstances. And I just know in my life, I've been so blessed by other people who are willing to bring me into their home. Yeah. Uh, and I hope that, that, that sometimes I, you know, I, I do that for others as well. It's interesting we use the term home-centered and not family-centered. Everyone has a home. Yeah. And I think it's trying to create the home as a place of worship. Yeah. Just don't leave worship to the church or the temple. There are opportunities to worship, to feel the Spirit, to engage in those practices in your home then that's where your worship should be centered and then supported by the church. Mm -hmm. and, and the amazing thing is, is it really works, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, because we create these new kinds of communities. And, and that's the way it worked in early Christianity. We know that one of the reasons why the church grew, I mean, there were lots of miracles and other things like that, but, but it grew because people welcomed other people mm -hmm. into their home. You know, part of um, what we're talking about with, with the apostles and with the book of, of Acts, post-Christ mortal ministry, is having the saints develop this trust in the teachings of the apostles. And as we look at, you know, our home-centered focus of church, how wonderful is it to think about the trust that we put in our modern-day prophets, just the timing of how it was instituted really can build faith. I don't think that that was a coincidence that these things were put in motion long before all of a sudden we were shut down uh, for a period of time where we couldn't go to church and we we really had to rely on the structure of the home environment, you know, to to be able to, uh, you know, to have that gospel teaching take place. Yeah, I would say that was a big testimony to me that our prophets really are seers, that they mm -hmm. see far off. They felt that they needed to prepare mm -hmm. us for something and, and when we needed it, it was there and yeah. just... What a wonderful resource Absolutely. we've had. Yeah, I mean, I think we can testify that the Spirit leads the church today just like it led the church mm -hmm. then. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. So as we're talking about some of the things that you know, we teach in our homes, it's one thing to, to, to tell us, okay, we're going to focus on church in the home. But it's the the outcome that comes from that. So in Acts chapter two, this is when Peter is teaching, and this is after the saints have felt that prick in their hearts. And he, in, in verse thirty eight, he tells them to repent, be baptized, and we see these these basic principles of the gospel um, that continue today. But then in verse forty, something I found interesting, and with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, "Save yourselves from this untoward 
generation. So there's a warning of what's out there. And then the very next chapter, you have this experience with Peter and John healing a lame man. As they approach this man, Peter, he looks on him and he's with John and he says, look on us, trying to get his gaze to fix on the these two apostles. And, and it's interesting how in verse five, he gave heed unto them, so he looks, expecting to receive something of them, maybe of a monetary value. And then Peter says in verse six, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. What I liked about this is it ties back, I think, when they say, look upon us, verse 41 continues, they that gladly received his word were baptized in the same day were added, they talk about 3,000 souls. But verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking bread and in prayers. This idea of look upon us, we have the word of God, and the word of God can bring healing to your souls. There's power in the word of God. I think one thing that our, this rising generation is challenged with is they live in the information age, mm -hmm. and they have so much access to information, but are they accessing truth? And as we look steadfastly toward the doctrine of the apostles, which is the truth of Jesus Christ, we can find healing, we can find wholeness, we can find direction and guidance. So I think that's one thing that comes to mind is looking for good sources of information, sources that you can trust. And you can always trust the doctrine of the apostles because it is the doctrine of Christ. And just in their day, they said, get out of the crooked ways, save yourselves from these crooked ways. There is a straight and narrow path. It is the doctrine of the apostles and prophets that will bring healing to your soul. And we've heard from modern day prophets and apostles, just of the healing power that comes from being centered in or anchored in Christ. And so I think this, this rising generation with all the information, with all the access that they have to information, if they could focus on the doctrine of Christ as a source of guidance for their souls, I think that would be, that would be helpful. One of my very favorite conference talks is probably from two decades ago by Elder Holland, and he talks about how an arrow coming out of the bow is set by the direction and strength of the archer and how we are launching our children. And so to me, it's just made me as a parent want to make sure that I teach my children very clearly that I know that God lives, that I know that Jesus Christ performed his atonement and that this is his church upon the earth. And they know where I stand on those things. I don't want them to have doubts about what I believe. I want them to be able to, when they have questions, to be able to rely on my testimony and be able to go forward with that strength, knowing my parents believe this and I can have faith in their faith until I can stand on my own. So I think it's incumbent upon us as parents to really be clear in our teaching, to really let our children know where we stand on things. This is a confusing world, but they need to know that we have a foundation. Mm -hmm. And that reminds me, Annie, of just the recent address by uh, President Nelson and his wife that focused on identity. Mm -hmm. That's the doctrine of the apostles, is what is your true identity? The youth these days can look at any number of things to kind of define themselves and determine their identity. But prophets, seers, and revelators are saying, your identity is a son or daughter of God, as a disciple and covenant follower of Jesus Christ. That's your core identity. That's strength. That keeps us from these crooked ways mm -hmm. when we understand our true identity as articulated and testified of by prophets, seers, and revelators. This has been a wonderful, wonderful conversation. And I just want to thank all of you. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your testimony. It's been a wonderful conversation Thanks, ben. Uh, with all you. So thank you very thank you. much. And for those of you watching at home, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation from Acts chapters 1 through 5. I encourage you to record and act upon any impressions that you've received. Come Follow Up is a study and learning resource, which includes this show, a podcast, inside stories, artwork, quotes, and much more offered through our website and social media channels. Next week, we're studying Acts chapters 6 through 9 and discussing aligning our hearts with God, becoming an instrument in His hands, and more. Thank you for watching.